The CDC says that one in three of us are going to have diabetes by 2050 if we don't do something. It's an increase in both type 1 and type 2. Uh, and so a huge public health issue. Uh, 26 million Americans have the disease right now. 78 million are at risk for getting diabetes because they already have a mildly elevated blood sugar. Huge problem. We typically think about diabetes as having two major components. Type 1 diabetes, an autoimmune destruction of the cells that produce insulin, and type 2 diabetes, primarily an effect on cells' inability to respond adequately to insulin that eventually results in the loss of the insulin production capacity. At the University of Minnesota, we have people interested in all aspects of diabetes research. This is a huge disease, and so we need to have people who are working in prevention and cure and complications, and we have people working in all of those areas. People with type 2 diabetes, we believe you have to inherit genes that put you at risk for getting the diabetes. People either inherit genes that make it so that their cells that make insulin don't work quite right. They make insulin, but they don't do it right. Or perhaps they make, have genes that make it so they don't, uh, they're very resistant to insulin. You know, if you have a parent with type 2 diabetes, your risk of getting the disease is about 30%. And so we can pick those people. if you exercise and maintain a leaner body mass, you can do a lot to put off when you're going to get that disease. Type 1 diabetes is not as easy to predict, uh, but we are learning that you can do blood tests that can identify people who are at risk, and then if we can understand that, we can then intervene, hopefully with very specific therapies designed on the particular marker the person has. So for nearly the last three decades, my lab has been committed to trying to analyze the relationship between obesity and diabetes, particularly type 2 diabetes. And in this arena, there have really been two transformational uh, ideas that have emerged in the last uh, decade. The first is that fat cells are not simply a benign storage site for excess calories in the form of lipids but that fat cells actually communicate with the rest of the body through the secretion of hormones that are fat derived. The second major uh, transformational event is that fat tissue is infiltrated with immune cells and that type 2 diabetes is largely a disease that's linked to inflammation. My lab studies how immune cells and how fat cells communicate. We analyze how small molecule drugs could potentially affect the inflammation and how fat cells might be able to recover from the inflammatory challenge. Now behind me is the University NMR Center. It's one of the largest, most well-developed NMR centers in the world. We have a number of high field magnets here. They're used for research purposes, not so much clinical care, but actually trying to identify at the molecular level what are those factors that are involved in diabetes, diabetes development, and how can we understand the structure and function of those molecules and place those into clinical context. Diabetes really requires people to think about the food that they eat, the exercise that they do, and the medication they take. In order to make that work, they need to understand how their disease works. And one of the real challenges is how do we best help patients understand that? That's something we have people who are interested in studying here at the university. We also need medicines that work better and we're interested in developing medicines. And we need new medicines because the ones that we have, we don't just need copycats of things that are existing because we know how those work. We need novel, completely different things that can try and have an impact on treatment. You know, we used to think diabetes uh, affected eyes, kidneys, and nerves, um, and that's all that affected. And now that we're so good at treating eye, kidney, and nerve problems, and people live long and well with diabetes, we're understanding there are other problems that can develop over time with exposure. We have so many people who have 40, 50, 60 years of type 1 diabetes now uh, that we never used to have. And we know now that there are changes that happen in their cognition, how well they think. In terms of the University of Minnesota profile in diabetes research, there are a number of major transformational research programs that are going on. 
Clearly at the forefront is islet cell transplantation. That's had a long history of excellence at the University of Minnesota and is internationally recognized. The bariatric surgery program at the University of Minnesota is a key component in our fight against diabetes and understanding the molecular mechanisms that link bariatric surgery to the restoration of insulin action is a major activity that a number of investigators are carrying out. So the University of Minnesota is really a worldwide leader in trying to understand the relationship between brain glucose metabolism and cognition, understanding, and therefore the ability to function in a low glucose environment. So we have a number of signature programs here at the University of Minnesota that are key, uh, key participants in our fight against diabetes. Cure is a pretty big word. And I think cure, in my mind, is going to actually have to require some transformation in how we think about the disease, much like what happened when people discovered insulin and found a treatment. I think these incremental steps that we're making to improve diabetes care are critically important, but we have to think about a cure, which means we have to keep funding research to find new ways to think about this disease. For years we have talked about that type 2 diabetes comes about because people don't make enough insulin and they don't use that insulin right. They're resistant to their insulin. Two things that are absolutely true. But we don't know why that happens. And we don't understand all the things that could go wrong in the body that can lead to that. And we have to. If we figure that out and we know what the problem is and we can prevent it from happening, then that will be a cure. People won't have diabetes. We won't, we won't have to cure them because they won't get it in the first place.